This is a movie about scaling pods on Kubernetes. When I started using Kubernetes for the first time, I got really excited because traditionally, every time I had to create new web applications, I had to go and provision infrastructure first. Now, when you have many web applications like front end and back end, this can be pretty tedious and this can slow development teams down while they have to wait for you to provision infrastructure. Now with Kubernetes, I can simply just hand over a YAML file and developers can plug that YAML file into their CI CD pipelines and deploy it to Kubernetes with ease. This process takes a couple of minutes rather than days. And no one has to constantly provision infrastructure anymore. The deployment file represents our source of truth of our infrastructure. It tells us what container image to deploy, what port to expose, what health probes to monitor, any configs, any secrets that may be required, resource requests and limits, as well as a number of replicas. When you start out with Kubernetes, this is great, but sometimes hard coding the number of replicas is not ideal. Let's say the demand of your application grows over time. You might need eight pods during the day to cope with the traffic demand, and maybe at night time you only need one pod. Now to demonstrate this, I'm going to run a simple Kubernetes cluster using Kind. I'm going to run Kubernetes 1.18 and this is going to create a Kubernetes cluster inside a Docker container. Because I'm running in Docker, the resources I've allocated is 6 CPU. So I'm going to have a Kubernetes machine with 6 CPU cores. And to demonstrate this, I have a simple Golang application that runs a web server and generates a little bit of CPU load using a for loop every time it gets a web request. I also have this very simple deployment YAML file that tells Kubernetes we want to run run one replica of the application. This is the container to run, expose on port 80, and we have a few resource requests and limits. So to deploy it, I simply change directory to where that YAML file is located. I say kubectl apply and off it goes. Now to simulate that traffic, I'm gonna deploy a simple traffic generator. Now, if you take a look at the traffic generator YAML file, it's a simple Alpine container that sleeps in a loop. And this is gonna allow me to deploy a small load testing utility and generate some traffic load to our application. So to start generating traffic, I'm going to exec into that pod. I'm going to install a lightweight utility for load testing called WRK. And then I'm going to run my load tester saying WRK, I'm going to run five connections over five threads. I'm going to give it a very long duration for the purpose of this demo. I'm also going to tell it to close every connection just so that it creates a number of unnecessarily high connections and call our example application. So that's going to go ahead and start up our load tester. So now that we have a high number of traffic on the system, and we have high CPU, I'm expecting our application to be struggling and customers to be having a hard time. Now, how do we know this? Usually you would be running something like Prometheus and have a dashboard with alerts to say high CPU, high CPU, or you would have customers complain that the site is slow. And this is great for us to get alerted, but how does Kubernetes know what's going on? And how can we make Kubernetes smarter to react to the situation? Kubernetes has this component called metric server. Metric server runs in the cube system namespace and it monitors key metrics such as CPU and memory of pods and nodes. It gathers this information at an interval and it writes it back to the API server. This means we can build pipelines around container metrics like autoscalers. Now Kubernetes has this component called metric server that is built and maintained by the Kubernetes community. You can find it on GitHub. They have a readme guide showing you all the use cases, requirements, and how to deploy it. Now it's important that you deploy the correct metric server version for the supported Kubernetes version that you have. So in this demo, I'm running Kubernetes 1.18. So I head over to the releases page and I downloaded the components YAML from here for metric server 0.3.7. In my Docker development YouTube series, GitHub repo, I have a Kubernetes folder. I have auto scaling folder with a readme. And here I list all the steps we're gonna be doing in this demo to showcase the horizontal pod autoscaler. So under this repo, I have a components folder and I pasted that components YAML into the metric server folder. So this is the metric server that I'm running over here. Now, if you're running a kind cluster, you probably want to disable TLS for the metric server in order to get it to work with kind. So if you take a look at the YAML file, what I've done is if you go down to the container spec, it has an argument. I needed to add these two arguments to get this to work with kind. If you're running metric server in production, you'll want to remove these two lines over here. 
here. Now to deploy it, I'm just gonna change directory to where that YAML file is located. And then I'm gonna say kubectl in the cube system namespace, and I'm gonna apply that YAML file. That's gonna go ahead and deploy metric server with all the role bindings and all the components it needs to run. To check it out, I can say kubectl in the cube system namespace, I can say get pods, and we should see metric server up and running. Now give it a couple of minutes, but you should be able to say kubectl top nodes, and you should see metrics coming through shortly. Now, after giving it a couple of minutes, I can say kubectl top nodes, and I can see here that I have one node currently sitting at 63% CPU with 162 megs of memory used. I can also say kubectl top pods, and I can see that my application is using 1,499 millicores and four megabytes of memory. I can also see my traffic generator is using a fair bit of resources as well. So now that Kubernetes knows exactly how much CPU and memory our application is using, and Kubernetes also knows how much CPU and memory our node is using, and Kubernetes also knows how much CPU and memory we've allocated to each of our pods. This allows us to do some cool things. Now Kubernetes knows we have a six core machine. One core equals a thousand millicores. Times that by six, we have 6,000 millicores on this node. Kubernetes knows we expect each pod to use 500 millicores defined in our YAML file. Dividing 6,000 by 500, the scheduler knows it's able to fit roughly 12 pods onto this machine. We can visualize each pod almost like a micro virtual machine that has 500 millicores of CPU. Now because of the high traffic load we saw earlier, our pod is currently sitting at 1,499 millicores. Technically it's running at 300% CPU. Now adding more pods would allow the CPU usage to spread and technically come down for each pod. The more pods we add, the better. Each pod will start use more or less the same CPU as we've allocated, and this is good. It's important that the allocated CPU is close to the desired optimal CPU for that workload. So now we know we requested 500 millicores of CPU for our application. We can also see running kubectl top pods that our application is currently using 1463 millicores. So that's almost 300% CPU. And we also know that our monitoring systems are throwing errors, customers are complaining the site is slow. So now it makes sense for us to scale the system up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say kubectl scale and I'm gonna scale to two pods to see what happens. And if I say kubectl get pods, we can see we have a second pod now, but it might take some time Time for the metrics to populate so you have to be patient and finally when I say kubectl top pods we can see that we now run 750 average CPU per pod so as I'm adding more pods the CPU load is spreading among the pods which is really helpful when scaling up so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna scale up even further so that we can get closer to that 500 millicore CPU threshold that we want so I say kubectl scale and I go up to four replicas so if I say kubectl get pods we can now see we have four pods up and running and now once we have four pods up and running we can see the cpu load is much better it's much more evenly spread within each pod and it's below the 500 millicore threshold that we've requested now every workload is going to be different so it's important to take a look at your monitoring system take a look at things like latency and other metrics to make sure you find the sweet spot for setting your request value of cpu correctly so in this demo basically my sweet spot for my application is 500 millicores as you can see i've specified 500 millicores cores in my YAML file. You want to find the sweet spot or making sure you can utilize as much of the CPU as possible. Now every workload is going to be very different but the fundamentals are still the same. That's why it's important to understand the impacts of setting the right request values for CPU and memory in your deployment YAML. Now let's take a look at how we can scale up these pods automatically based on these values. Now the horizontal pod autoscaler is what's used to scale pods and it's usually supported by, by many Kubernetes versions. To see if it's supported you can say kubectl API versions and you should see the autoscaling API over here. You can see I have three auto scaling API support. Now what we're going to want to do is deploy a horizontal pod auto scaler for this deployment and what that allows us to do is we can specify how much CPU we want this pod to use as a sweet spot. So basically what I can say is that the horizontal pod auto scaler needs to check and make sure that my application is below 95% of that 500 millicores. So to do that I say kubectl auto scale, I target my deployment 
and I say that I want to be able to scale between a minimum of one and a maximum of 10 pods. I also want to scale up when the CPU percent is higher or around 95%, 95% of the 500 millicores I've requested. This means if my pod starts going higher than about 480 millicores, we're going to see a scaling up event. So I go ahead and run this. This will create a horizontal pod auto scaler. And then for some information, I can say kubectl get HPA and I can run OY to get more details. And what this is going to show me is the percentages of CPU utilization. So currently you can see we're using 0% of the 95% for this deployment. Now, as we only have one pod, if I start generating load again, you will see we will use roughly 1,400 millicores. That means we're probably going to be sitting at around 300% over the 95 and that will scale up. And then the auto scaler will keep scaling until we are close to this 95% value. So you can see traffic has come in and we're sitting at 1,600 millicores. If I say kubectl get HPA, we can see we are at 320%. So this would trigger a scale up event. We can also describe the HPA by running the describe command. And we can see that the HPA has done the calculations. It's currently sitting at 321% over the 95. And it's, it's determined that it would need four pods to scale up and cater for this demand. So if we say kubectl get pods, we can see the autoscaler has summoned four pods in total. And if we do kubectl top pods, we can see CPU is spread among these pods. You can see we're still quite hot on CPU. We're using 140% out of the 95. So the desired replicas have actually gone up from four to six now if we say kubectl get pods we can see we now have six pods created and if we run kubectl top pods now we can see we're now sitting roughly around the 500 millicore sweet spot we can also see we're very close to the 95 percentage now it's important to know that cpu also can be very spiky so it's not like cpu usage is always very constant that's why you'll find that the pod autoscaler might not always hit the 95 percent value on the spot it might be slightly above or slightly below and that's that's probably okay. That's because the horizontal pod autoscaler has to take a while to scrape some metrics from the metric server to make sure it doesn't just scale up aggressively when CPU spikes happen. You can see now after it's waited some time, it's actually come down from 105% and it's now 74%. So it's now within the perfect threshold of six replicas and it's sitting below that 500 millicore sweet spot. Another important piece of information to know is that from Kubernetes 1.18, they've introduced the V2 beta horizontal pod autoscaling API, which allows you to supply scaling policies. So this allows you to override the default behavior and you can actually set scale down and scale up policies for different timeouts and periods and values that you want to use. So it's important to know with Kubernetes 1.18 and up, you can actually override the default values of the horizontal pod autoscaler to cater for your needs. So without really good monitoring and insights, it can be quite difficult to find the right request value for CPU and memory. There's another piece of software called the Virtual vertical pod autoscaler that you can run in recommendation mode. It'll basically sit and monitor the actual CPU and memory usage over time and provide you with recommendations of what you can put in your YAML file. So I hope this video was helpful and helped you guys build a foundation of how resource utilization works in Kubernetes and why it's important to allocate the right CPU and memory values and also how it's important for autoscaling pipelines. So be sure to like and subscribe and check out the community page down below in the description box. And if you wanted to support the channel further be sure to become a member and as always thanks for watching and until next time peace